The Book of Sanctuary is about the archives of the Dukes of Hamilton. And the archives run for about 400 years. They're handwritten and very clear. The archive has been very carefully preserved and is in beautiful condition. It is in the Hamilton Central Library and it's a farming record of the Clydeside Valley from Camberslang all the way through to Schotts and Camberslang all the way through to Straven, about 500 farms. The book I've written up and which I sent to you is an attempt to give you an understanding of the difference between the rented estate and the, the feud estate. The feud estate is part which is sold on. The rented estate was put into entail in 1689 and ran till 1920 when the uh, entailment came to an end and the Hamilton estates were put up for sale. And my father was a civil servant in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, working on the grants for the various farms which are inside the same landscape. So it's, it's quite a, a, a circular story there. And I worked at Whiston Lodge for a couple of years, which is funded by coal extracted from mines near Les Mahigo, also owned by the Dukes of Hamilton. So they had both farming and mining interests, and the archive contains both sets of records with very full details. The um, complexity is that to try to understand it, you have to understand that the Hamilton Estates is not one single collection of records. It's actually a collection of barony records gathered together. And I sent you a list of them in the booklet. We've got places like Avondale, Drumsagard, which includes Cambus Lang. We have Edges of East Cobride. We have Bothell Muir, which stretches from Bothell Castle all the way through to Shots before the formation of the town of Motherwell. And the town of Larkall, the town of Lesmahago, Straven and Stonehouse are all included as early starts and then later on developments. The farming records started in about the early 1600s in Old Scots, which of course is quite difficult to read. But the records I'm looking at, dating from roughly 1700 through to 1800 and then 1800 on to 1900, are the factors report to the Duke. So it's effectively a set of accounts prepared each year, uh, summarising in 300 pages, all the rents collected, all the fees collected, and the money spent on stipends for the teaching, the ministers, the support for the palace and its 50 staff, the um, maintenance of the estate, building of farmhouses, extension of the, the farm field system, fencing in, the building of bridges, drainage and ploughing and um, ditching of the landscape, and the building and rebuilding of Hamilton Palace, which is another story also included in, in there. And the farms are entailed within a central core and then the feud estate seems to be on the boundary line outside where the Hamilton lands matched up with Douglas lands. Uh, so there's a very complicated, uh, long-running feud between the Douglas estates and the Hamilton estates, mainly because they both vied to be the uh, duke in waiting to be next king, neither of whom gained that. So they, they kind of fell out from that a couple of hundred years and then built castles and fought each other and eventually came to settlement. And the, the current Duke of Hamilton is Douglas Hamilton. And the Douglas family archives inc include a lot of Hamilton archives as well. So there's a very involved situation. The book that I prepared um, summarised this and is an, uh, an introduction to the 500 different farms um, and the houses in Hamilton town itself, all of which were either rented or owned by the Dukes of Hamilton, and where we have the history of the whole of the town of Hamilton and the history of the farmlands 
counterbalancing um, in terms of a development of the history. Um, I summarized it by the family surnames and created maps, and I'll try and show you some of those just to see if that's uh, a bit helpful. So the grid is from Avondale, which includes Straven. And this is a grid showing the Ordnance Survey map references, the two digit references, top and at the top is east west, and at the side is north south. And underneath are the records taken from the Dukes of Ar uh, Archives listing the farms under the surname. So the one called Rental in 1917, Hamilton, this is part of the family of Hamilton, Peel Hill, Grayson Hill, New Houses and Waterhead, and then Fleming, which is another frequent name, Miko, Martinholm, Middle Raw, Muir of Stonehill, um, and then we've got the some few records as well, all the way to Little Drum Clog, White Shaw, Windy Edge, with quarries mentioned. Allison is another investor. In ordinate survey terms, the various family interests as they cluster together as a way of trying to get a pattern. And on this grid map, which I've tried to show, there's a kind of arrow shape. And that arrow shape is the entailed estate within the, the, the the core of the Hamilton's control map references 62 against 36. And you've got FH together. So that's Fleming and Hamilton, and then two more Hamiltons. This is few states. So they've been sold on, but they're still occupied by people called Hamilton. So th there's some interesting stories there. That seems to be the boundary of the estate in the region of these farms. So if that's helpful, I can show you some more of these. It's possible. This Boswell Barony, it has a different pattern. Um, it stretches out towards shots at the 84, 85, 86 part on the upper um, right-hand side of the, the, the grid where we've got um, the shots town developing and shots was improved by coal mining. It was such a bleak area. Listed on this list under the extract of rental for shots, we have Annie's Hill, Brown Hill, Shots House and Farm. Middle Braco, which is near the, what's the modern Kirkushot's television transmitter, and then Duntaland, which is just north of the shots, and there's a major quarry just beside the M8 motorway. So that's as far as that, that is about as far north as this part of the estate stretched. And um, it just illustrates that there are huge huge ranges of different parts of the estate, um, each part of which has a different pattern. So this is back at Avondale. And if I now try and find um, Dalserf, and Dalserf is very interesting for two or three reasons. One, it has one of the original churches um, of after the conversion from Catholic to Protestant, but also it has the quarry from which the stone was cut, which formed the columns in the front of the rebuilt Hamilton Palace. And the columns are dragged as single lumps of huge stone, um, black basalt, 30 tons in weight, 30 feet long, with a, a wagon 30 feet long, and a team of 30 horses hauled it all the way to Hamilton Palace. Um, and those stones were then cut 
uh, and then installed a single blocks of stone 30 feet long or 30 feet tall as a porch to the Hamilton Palace, which you might be able to see in the photograph which was sent with this collection. And um, this area is called Dalserf, so it's down near the Clyde, but places like Consuluch and um, the Dungavo Coal Company is mentioned there, Skeletons mentioned there. These are coal facilities uh, in an area which looks nowadays rather rural and awfully nice to look at. And one of the answers is these coal mines were deep coal. They were dug down beneath the surface so that on the surface the Hamilton estates rented the farm, but beneath the surface the coal was extracted and the Hamilton estate gained its income from renting of, or, or not renting of the land as much, so much as extraction of the coal and most coal brought in two and six a ton perhaps or roughly that kind of figure for house calls. But in the area of Les Mahago, the coal mines there were gassy coals and they were used to form town gas. And the Duke gained seven pound a ton for each um, load of coal that came out of the town gas. And that's the money that funded Whiston Lodge. And if you want to go and see, Whiston Lodge is just about to open again, and it would probably welcome your visit if you want to go and see it. It's a hunting lodge dating from 1888, and it was set up by the um, mining engineer answering to the Duke of Hamilton from the coal mines at Les Mahago under Draffen estate. And Draffen is the farm discussed in the booklet I sent you, chapter 10, and it contains a hence list of the kind of detailed farming history which is possible to be extracted from uh, the estate records. So it holds a whole series of different ownerships, some uh, obviously larger scale, some smaller scale, and um, the lease, or rather a few, is mentioned there as well. And also in Draffen, there is probably the remains of a Douglas castle. I think it was the University of Glasgow Field School which was going to excavate it. But the week before they actually set up the digging, the farmer withdrew permission. Um, we'd been down there previously to do fields, walking across it to do uh, the surveys to, to set it up for the archaeology. But they, they were archaeologists, not uh, a guaranteed uh, reminder. I think the farmer was worried that his cows might break their legs on anything we left as incomplete leaf, or, or ditches not completely filled in. I think they found the well on the, the, the survey, and the well is where the castle was centred. Um, and just beyond that point, there is a standing castle which is uh, unique in Europe. It has a, a particular construction which is um, to do with a wall containing extra gunshot or, or cannon shot um, loopholes. And it, it was a Hamilton castle built to defend the Hamilton lands against the Douglas lands. So that's an area where the two estates cooperated not to actually fall out too often, but you know, they built castles, so there was obviously a bit of argument at one time or another. And going back to Hamilton Town, a frequent name that came out of the records is Aikman of Ross. Ross House and its estates are now buried under the motorway, the M74, but Aikman owned quite a number of different premises in that town of Hamilton, so there is a hint there that there might well have been, uh, Hamilton town might not have been completely under the control of the Dukes of Hamilton. Perhaps there were competitors to control the town. Um, in the town of Hamilton itself, the Bent Cemetery is still there, and across the road from it was the mine 
owned by the Dixon Company, which was the most productive in the area. And nearby it are nice um, cottages, basically, uh, which are rather a contrast since it seemed to be as old as the mining operation itself. So there's, in that area of Hamilton, it's still possible to see the remains or hints of the remains of mining. And some of those are in the records as farms almost continuously from the 1680s through to 1920s. The total rental income, the Hamilton states, from farms was roughly 25,000 to 30,000 per year between about 1800 and 1900. From the day, from 1850, they began to co mine coal on an industrial scale across the whole of the landscape at about 100,000 a year. So they kept the, rent, the farm rentals fairly stable throughout the whole of this industrial period when you would expect prices to rise through the roof. But I think what they were doing was trying to keep the loyalty of farmers to stay on the farm rather than running away to become a miner. The Dukes were very proud, of, uh, certainly in the 1820s, they were extremely proud of the landscape they'd created because they had not only uh, created farms out of the, the old run rig system, but they had fenced it in with nice fences and then nice hor thorn hedges. And every year they had a team of 10 in the winter, about now, out there in the middle of the, the, the landscape, clipping down the hedges or dressing the hedges, dressing the forested units. So they were, they, the Dukes regarded their um, stewardship of the landscape as extremely important. There, there were some difficulties, of course, in managing an estate. They managed it through the professional factor. In the early 1800s, these were John Boyce Jr. and John Boyce Sr. And in the booklet of century, there is a, a report of a case involving Mr. Boyce. And it appears that Mr. Boyce asked the troop for his fee. Uh, Mr. Boyce is a self-employed professional managing land. And he was managing 500 different units and producing cash flow worth 30,000 a year. But he seemed not to feel that he'd been paid. So he agreed with, I think, the seventh trick that he would take some of the land sales and keep that as his fee. The eighth troop perhaps didn't notice it. The ninth troop woke up to it and objected because I think somebody asked the ninth troop to confirm who owned the land they sat on and they believed that they were now the owners of the farm and the farm lands and the duke was very surprised to hear that he in fact lost control of that part of his estate. Part of the reason why these archives are so beautifully written up, so clearly written that there are no scores out, there is no sign of scrabbling around as is often the case with accounting records, is I think this is all part of a legal process of forcing the factor to admit he'd stolen possibly as much as 10% of the whole estate, not stolen, acquired the benefit of the sale of the land. As well as these detailed records, I tracked down as many of the farms with Ordnance Survey references using the 1864 maps, the first edition Ordnance Survey, and any subsequent maps I could obtain using the digital maps to dig beneath sometimes the presented surface to get at these farm names and most of them are still traceable. So there are farmhouses still occupied now which are recorded as being built, extended or compensated for mining subsidence in these records. The landowner, the Duke of Hamilton, was legally responsible if any mine undermined the farm cottage, even if he had nothing to do with the mining. That was the law of the land. He was a landowner and he compensated his tenants. So these wrangles are there, as are, of course, hints of boundary wrangles, people falling out with each other. I, I mentioned the quarry where they, they brought the, the columns out of it. To clear access to the, the quarry, they engineered the removal of the tenant farmer by deciding he wasn't actually quite good at the job, even though the group, in the fact, did agree that he was actually quite a good farmer. But they wanted access and brought that about, basically. And then there are separate stories about the same farmer breaking into his neighbour's house and trying to kill them. So there's a whole host of these human stories underneath the calm appearance of a rental record. I can go on talking about the, uh, the transition, for instance, Ham Canvas Line began, of course, as such fields like Redcoat Hill. Uh, now it became 
industrial place, they needed water supplies, they needed railway systems to pass through it, they took on all that land. He made quite a lot of money out of selling bits of land to them. Steel mills at Hall site, which gained £10,000 and a nice cheque for selling that land. And the tunnel for the Caledonia Railway ended up 25000 because he was worried that the railway might disturb the white cattle. And the railway company was of the opinion that the white cattle had never stood in that bit of land in their entire history. But the Duke won the point as he owned the land and they wanted the tunnel. And the Duke built his own railway line. And in addition, most of the mines had their own small scale mineral lines, including the one just down beside the Avon, where Eric was one of the other people doing the excavation there at the mining village. And that mine on the edge of the Châtelerault estate was the only estate within the boundaries of Châtelerault estate. And it produced coal called coal gum, which when they were building the extension to Hamilton Palace, they used the coal gum, I think, as dampener to soak up water because the effort to build the extension to Hamilton Palace lasted 10 years. It took 15,000 tonnes of stone and most of it came from a little quarry on the edge of the park barn, which is near Blantyre and the Boswell Bridge. And if you go to Boswell Bridge, you'll see some wonderful gate posts. And that's the back door to Hamilton Palace. From there, all the way down to the town centre of Hamilton, that's the size of Hamilton Palace's private ground. Thank you.